what's with all the stars? In Python 3.0, additional unpacking syntax was added under the label PEP3132. And in Python 3.5, which sounds like it was pretty recent, but it was actually quite a while ago, additional unpacking generalizations were added. Let me show you what those are all about. When you have a tuple and you unpack it, we all know that when you do this, A is going to be equal to one, and B is going to be equal to two. That's a gimme. We have used this unpacking syntax. We use it in the head of a. We use it in the header line of a for loop. We use it all the time. But we also probably know that if we have too many things on the right hand side, it fails, and if we have too many things on the left hand side, it also fails. In other words, the unpacking syntax, unlike in other languages like JavaScript, is actually quite strict here, in that it requires that the number of elements that you're unpacking on the left hand side and the number of elements you're unpacking on the right hand side are ex or you're unpacking from the right hand side are exactly the same. However, PEP3132 adds our ability to do this A B star C. And now we can unpack any number of elements as long as there are at least two, and all of the remaining elements get put into this extra parameter C, which you would think would be a tuple, but is actually a list. PEP448 is slightly different. PEP448, the additional unpacking generalizations, took some unpacking that we were able to do and generalized a little bit further. Let's say we have a list X's and Y's that contain the values 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6, and we put them into ZS. If you look at ZS, we can see it retained the level of nesting of X's and Y's. So this is not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. This is 1, 2, 3 in a list, 4, 5, 6 in a list with that same level of nesting retained with that discrimination between the X's values and the Y values retained. So we've just added one more box around this. However, PEP448 allows us to unpack X's into ZS, Y's into ZS, and this actually does the flattening. It removes all the elements of X's and puts them into ZS, removes all the elements of Y and puts them into ZS. And we can put it not only into a list, but into a set or into a tuple. And of course, the parentheses for a tuple are optional. The comma is what makes a tuple. The parentheses are only needed for disambiguation. This is PEP448. Additionally, PEP448 says, you know what, if we have two dictionaries, we can double star unpack them into a third dictionary. And this D3 will be the result of taking all the key value pairings in D1 and all the key value pairings in D2 and unpacking them. And you can see where there's overlap in the case of B and C, whichever of the two as specified last is the one that wins. Now, this gives us now about four, five, maybe six different ways to perform merging on a dictionary. Historically, if somebody wanted to merge a dictionary, they would make a copy of one and then use the dot update uh, method in order to add in the elements from the other. Or if they were willing to use the iter tools module, they would chain the items from one against the items from the other and dump that into a dictionary. Or you could do this using the syntax that we saw before using that PEP448 unpacking syntax. Or if they wanted to use the collections module, they could use collections.chainmap, and then they could materialize that chain map into a regular dictionary. Otherwise, you know, you can still see each of the individual mappings. And with PEP448, we have this syntax. And now in, in Python 3.9, there's this syntax as well. And so we have many choices for how we might want to go about unpacking dictionary. Just between you and me, I actually think that these two are pretty much interchangeable, and I don't really see the strong motivation for this. The other ones I actually think are somewhat meaningful in terms of how they're distinct, although this one's a little bit out of date. But these two are very slightly different than this, and I think there's some nuance there. But rather than go into that nuance, I want to share with you why any of this matters in the first place, and I want to tie it to something that you might have seen before if you were ever writing code in the Python 2 era. In the Python 2 era, oops, let's make sure that we're running this in Python 2 and not in Python 3. So we'll run this like that. In Python 2, if we divide two numbers, we will get a different result depending on whether we're dividing two integers, two floats, or an integer and a float. Five divided by two in Python 2 could give us an answer of two or an answer of 2.5. Hold on a second. Why is he talking about division? when we're talking about unpacking, what's the relationship? Well, notice here, there is a fundamental ambiguity. It is often the case that in our code, there is a hidden line. 
and that hidden line divides the authors of some library code and the users of some library code. And the authors aren't always the users and the users aren't always the authors. And as a consequence, it may be the case that the person who wrote this code didn't know that this code would be run in this fashion. Or the person who wrote this code wasn't really participating in the creation of this. Well, one of the things that genuinely helps us in the writing of our code is to ensure that we, have, we only need local information in order to determine what an operation does. And if you think about it, if all you saw is this function and you took this result, and you took that result and then you went and you used it for something, and you went and you used it for something like say an indexing of another structure, whether you get an integer back or whether you get a float back is going to make a difference. And it's gonna make a difference because this could, this may or may not be valid. And you will not know whether this is valid or not without knowing all of all of the places in the code itself where this function was used, which you will never know and will be, you know, fairly, fairly, shall we say, a pain to go and search out and ensure correct. And so in the Python 2 era, we would solve this in a couple of different ways. One way we'd solve it is by forcing one of these values to be a float, which then forces this to be float division. Another way we'd do this is by taking the behavior of Python 3 using a pragma from future import division. And this is another way we would solve this. And we gotta put this at the very top. It's another way we'd solve it. But fundamentally, these approaches were about eliminating ambiguity, eliminating modalities, making it so that I can understand what this line of code does without having to know all of the details of how it's called. Another way we would solve it is by, you know, when we take the Python 3 style division, disambiguating between the single slash, which means true division, give me the real answer, and the double slash, which means floor division, meaning give me the answer rounded down towards negative infinity. Bear in mind, there is no truncating division in Python. Well, there's no division operator for truncating in Python. Now, what we can see in Python 3 is that Python 3 eliminates this ambiguity completely. And you might say, oh, that's a little bit of the Python 3's desire to be a little bit more humane with the numerical system. Python 2 had an integer and a long object that it distinguished, and Python 3 eliminates that. And this is just Python 3, you know, trying to eliminate some ambiguity, make things a little bit friendlier for you. But I think it's actually part of a pattern that helps us understand where that unpacking could be used. Because here's a not too dissimilar problem. We have a function, and it takes two things, and it adds them together. And let's say that the addition that's happening here is not an arithmetic addition, but a container addition. It takes two bags of stuff, and it wants to do something with all of the stuff in these two bags. It wants to concatenate these. And this will work if we have a tuple and a tuple that we're concatenating, or a list and a list we're concatenating, but it fails if we have a list and a tuple, and it fails if we have a tuple and a list. And this is not too dissimilar from our float and int. We have to know about the things that are passed to the function to know whether this function is even correct in the first place. And what we can think is, this is a problem. Because if we don't really know for certain whether somebody's passing a list, a tuple, a set to this function, we cannot safely perform this, oh, great, these two things, and join them together. And as long as they pass something consistent, everything's fine. But we don't know for certain without searching through all of the code base. We cannot assess the correctness of this code using just the information above the line, using just the information from the code itself. And so what do we do? Well, one thing we might do is we might force both of these sides into lists, and that's not too dissimilar from what we did to solve the division problem, except these could be large structures. And because these are large structures, this could require, or this will require, some allocation, will require some copying, and that copying could be quite large. We'll need a copy of x's, the original one, and a copy of x's turned into a list, that one. We need a copy of y's and the one, and, and uh, the y's that's been turned into a list. And if y's is already a list or x is a list, we'd either have to add logic to avoid having to do this or pay the cost of doing a copy that we didn't need to do in the first place. And notice how clumsy this is. We have to do both sides. This is a real pain in the butt. We have to remember to do this every single time. So what can we do? Well, one thing we could do is we could say, you know what, we don't need the concrete data, so we'll use iterTools.chain, which is a generalized approach that allows us to chain any iterables. And we could take iterTools.chain and we could unpack it into a list. Or we could just go directly for what we wanted and we could use this PEP448 unpacking generalizations to make this line unambiguous. As long as X's is something that could be iterated over, as long as Y's is something that could be iterated over, which is still a requirement, but a much smaller requirement than saying, oh, hey, this has to be an exact tuple, 
this line will work and we know exactly what the result will be. Previously, if we pass in two tuples, we get a tuple. If we pass in two lists, we get a list. Here, we always get a list. And so we have much better ability to understand what this line does with less ambiguity. We know exactly that it's returning a list. We know exactly it's taking all the things in X's and all the things in Y's. And the constraints that we have here, just to make sure that X's and Y's can be iterated over. This is why this matters and this is why this syntax exists. Why does the other PEP3132 syntax exist? Well, you may have written code like this, for underscore in range 10. And the reason that you wrote code like this is because you wanted to indicate to the reader of your code, oh, I'm doing something some number of times. I'm printing something to the screen some number of times. And the reason you did the for underscore is because you know this is a convention in Python code to represent a variable name that we don't care about. Because you think that if you had a loop here and you said 4x in range 10, and this loop was really long, somebody's going to be looking through and say, OK, where do you actually use x? But here, it's really clear. You weren't planning to use that loop variable. You were just planning to do the action some number of times. So we can see the naming of these things can convey to somebody, don't worry about this thing. Focus on the intent. Don't worry about the details of what this, where this loop variable is going to go. Let's say we had some data and we wanted to get the beginning of the data or the end of the data. We could say, turn this thing into a list if it's not concrete and give me the zeroth element. Or we could do this unpacking, give me the head, and throw away the rest. And of course, this will materialize the data, and it will allocate memory for this thing. So maybe this doesn't work that great if this structure is very, very large. And it doesn't work that great if the structure, you know, we don't really want to materialize it. Maybe just a next call would be good. But you can see that this really nicely says, I care about the first element and I don't care about the rest. Similarly, we could say, I care about the last element and I don't care about the, the other ones. And again, maybe that's still kind of marginal. But where I use this a lot and where I like it is this syntax. This syntax says, I care about the very first element. I care about the very last element. I don't care about the elements in the middle. And you might think it's equivalent to this, but it's not because this presumes there are at least two elements. And this will break if there are less than two elements. It says I care about the first and the last element and I know they're distinct. And to express that in this syntax is going to be kind of a pain because you have to say if len x's is greater than 2. And you know what? If this is some sort of generator or whatnot, you can't do len on that. And so that makes your life a little bit harder. And so you'd need to write some kind of custom function. But I really like the way this reads. This says care about the first, care about the last, don't care about the middle. And it conveys very nicely to somebody what I'm trying to accomplish.